two years to within the hour of his only professional loss in the ring to Buster Douglas, Mike Tyson was found guilty of the three charges against him. Tyson is in prison. He gets convicted on a rape charge. So I've got a guy named Mitch Blood Green who fought Tyson once on the street and once in the ring. And they hate each other. I say to Al Braverman, can you get him in to the facility where Tyson is being kept? He goes, oh, I can get him in. He said, what's he going to say to him, Mike Tyson? I said, he's not going to say anything to Mike Tyson. He's going to hit him with the best shot. And when Tyson gets out, who's the fight that everyone's going to want to see? What made you so good at picking the winners? I just had watched boxing all my life, and I had an aptitude for it. I could tell who would win. Manny Pacquiao fought a guy named Tim Bradley. He beat Tim Bradley nearly to death, mm -hmm. and he lost the decision. And Manny has tax problems. He said, it's not going to hurt me in terms of my marketability because everyone's going to see I won this fight. So somebody behind closed doors bought two of the judges. Yeah. Why is it that even though fans watch fights and knowing it was fixed, they still keep wanting to watch these fights? In fights that have any consequence at all, you have to follow the money. If it's going to go to a decision, it's going to favor the guy who's going to bring money to the business. Canelo Alvarez was fighting Floyd Mayweather. Mayweather will handle him with ease. They can't let Mayweather lose. They will have him either win one card or get a draw on one card. And then they can frame the narrative. He suddenly becomes the best fighter of all time. My guest today is Charles Farrell. He wrote a book called Low Life. Good title. A memoir of jazz fight fixing and the mob. This man is known as one of the greatest fixers in the sport of boxing we've had in the last, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years, 40 years. And he's gonna tell us maybe some juicy stories. We'll see what's gonna happen with that being said. Charles, thank you so much for being a guest. Thank you for inviting me. So uh, off camera, you fully committed to disclosing all the names. You committed to that, I just want you to know that. Every one of the names, except for the ones that'll get me in trouble. <laughs> Fair enough. So what a title. Why low life? Why'd you call it low life? Well, I, it's parenthetical, as you know. Of course, I fully get it. So, I get it. The life itself has its low attributes. Yep. And some of what I did might be considered low life behavior, but it's conjectural. And it's a, it's a question of what side of the fence you're on when you do these things. So, so I've seen you play, I mean, the music instruments you play, like it's insane watching you play. I watched the videos of you playing. Boxing, you were a kid following boxing, and then people were coming up to you for recommending fights, and all of a sudden you go into fixing. Can you kind of give me the evolution of how that took place? Sure. Um, I've always been interested in boxing. Okay. And I've always been involved in music. But I had a, a mobster uncle. Well, my, my grandfather's sister's husband was a mobster named Joe Martini from New Jersey. And you grew up in Jersey? No, I grew up in Boston. Okay. But he got would it. come to visit. Got it. And one of the things that I got from him, one of the things that interested me about him, is that he was a genuinely larger than life figure. He was incredibly gregarious, he was generous, he was emotional. And I thought, you know, here was a guy who, when I was a little kid, would say to me, he would give me a, a math equation. And if I got it right, which I did, he would slip $5 into my pocket. And he knew how to slip the money into my pocket, which is a skill, is, you know. And I thought, wow, that's a kind of an interesting way to live. He'd, he'd always come with a new car. So I, I thought, this is, a, this is a pretty fascinating life. He fixed up a concession for one of my grandfather's brothers at a hotel in Boston. And it turns out that the hotel was connected with um, a mobster named Maurice Levy, who owned Birdland and owned Roulette Records and, you know, and uh, what, what year is this? This would have been, I would have known, this would have been the early 60s. Okay, got and it. So I was just a kid. Got it. And I met a boxing, a Boston boxer who took dives periodically, a very good fighter named Tommy Tibbs, who's obscure now, but had something like 150 or 160 pro fights. Very, very good fighter who had a losing record, but didn't need to have a losing record. And I followed boxing, and Tommy said to the mob guys who used to come to this concession, Charles knows everything there is to know about boxing. You could bet the, the guys he predicts will win fights and you guys will win money. So they started having me pick the winners for them. 
And that got me involved in gambling on boxing because they would give me money to make predictions for them and then they would make my bets for me and they looked out for me for a while. And how, then, how did you make your money? What was the model? Like if you gave them the right picks, did they give you a 5% spiff or did you, did you make you know, some? You know, well, I mean, or they would get a bet in for me or they would do both. And you, you're how old at this time? Uh, 12. You're, tw you're 12 years old and Tommy is saying that you know how to pick the winners. Yes. So what was your system for picking the winners? I just had watched boxing all my life and I had an aptitude for it. I could tell who would win. I just knew boxing. You said something, you said th there's a difference. You said there's a lot of guys right now that write good blogs that can figure out who can win, win a fight and they have the right to exist, but they'll get it right 75% of the time. The key is to go to 90%. What made you so good at picking the fights, you know, picking the winners? Well, as I said, part of it is just natural aptitude, but also you get, the more you know about it, you start talking to people and you start spending time in the gym. And the gym is really, if fights are real, and most fights are real. What percentage is real? Well, I, I could give you a percentage. I could say 90% of fights are real, but it's more complex than that. Because to a great degree, real fights are, are so set up, the information is so predetermined that without fixing the fights, you're still gonna get them right. Um, and that's predicated on the way business works and the way matchmakers work. So for example, if I've got a young kid and I want him to win his fights and I don't wanna fix his fights, <clears throat> what I can do is I can get information about the trajectory of other fighters. If a guy is, 10 and eight or 10 and 10, and he works driving a truck, or he works at a factory, and he's in the God. gym for a couple of hours a week, and he doesn't want to get hurt, he's got a wife and kids, he's not gonna fight with the same type of intensity. And I will know that. And so even though the fight is, isn't fixed, I know this guy is not going to go more than two or three rounds because he's not, not gonna want mm -hmm. to get hurt. Yeah. So if you, Factor that in to what percentage of fights are fixed, then it becomes 50. So would you say a lot of the of fights that you were picking were they, you know, let's just say in, in baseball, you have major leagues, you have triple A, double A, single A, whatever, and then you got high college, you know, bait, you know, high school. Were a lot of these fights local fights, Boston fights, New York fights, or were they the big fights that you were picking winners? All of the above. All of the above. All of the above. So how do you how are you able to be uh, good at it with uh, picking fights that maybe the fighter's not from Boston, he's from New York, maybe he's from LA, maybe he's from Philadelphia, maybe he's from a different place, and you can't see his training routine. How do you get that intel? Well, in the beginning, I couldn't. Okay. In the beginning, I got it all from, from television, from watching these guys and by analyzing them. So my percentages weren't as good, but they were still good. And then when I got just a little bit older, I spent lots of time in New York, lots of time in Vegas. You know, I, I went to the places where the fighters were and I got to know fighters and people would call me. And there was a, there was a kind of network. Interesting. I went to a 2008 Kentucky Derby, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm there with my wife. They tell us the night before, hey, if you wanna go talk to the horse, go see the horses and talk to the trainers, be up at four o'clock, you have access. ESPN's right. gonna be there, everybody's gonna be there. I'm like, okay, I wanna go. My wife's like, you go, I don't need to go. I said, okay. I woke up, I went there, got the card, show it to him, I get in. And the trainer of this horse called Eight Bells, Mm -hmm. is talking, okay, Eight Bells is a horse that she looked beautiful, like, you know, this she could pull it off, and then that was the year of, I believe, Big Brown, I don't know if you remember Big Brown, the horse, he was like the main one, you know, everybody wanted to have Big Brown, everybody was banking on Eight Brown, and they asked the question, they said, so what could you tell us about Eight Bells? He says, she's so competitive that she's willing to race her heart at, even though it costs her life, mm -hmm. okay? So I'm standing next to all these guys, kind of like yourself, they're looking at stuff, they're looking at the way horse walks, they're looking at the temperament, they're looking at the mood because that's the day of the big Kentucky Derby. The final race starts, she's in it with Big Brown. They're racing. She comes out of nowhere, goes all the way down to second place. Big Brown wins, 50 yards later, she falls, crashes, her leg, breaks her leg, became the first time ever to euthanize a horse on a racetrack of Kentucky Derby. Mm -hmm. 135,000 people in the audience are crying. It was absolutely intense. That experience stayed with me. It's just a very emotional moment. But sure. in the morning, I was watching everybody on how they looked at the horses. 
When you're going to Vegas, when you're going to these different places and you're looking at these fighters, what are you looking for? How do you know if they're gonna be good or bad? Are you looking for amount of time they're in the training? Are you looking for how nimble they look, if they're eating, if they're listening to their coach, if they're focused? What are some things you're looking for? Strangely enough, the first thing you're looking for, the most important thing, is whether they're in shape. That's more important than everything else. Conditioning. Conditioning. Okay. Because if things get difficult, that's the first the Makes first sense. thing that can go, you know, that can go bad with you. You look for talent. That's a big thing. You look for the way the matchup is done. So their opponent is a major factor. What too. does that mean? What does that mean like? Well, you, what you need to do is analyze strengths and weaknesses, relatively speaking. So, you know, so-and-so does this well, and that matches up very, very well with what his opponent can't do. So there's that. That's a very big thing. But you also look at recent, I mean, as is true in horse racing, you look at recent activity, and then you get backstory. And backstory is big. What are these guys going through at any given time? And then you factor all these things together, and then once you've done that, now we're talking about real fights. We're not talking about fixed fights. What, yet. what are you talking backstory? So backstories, you're looking for what? Backstory, you're looking for what relationship, boyfriend, you know, girlfriend, yeah, wife, drug use, drinking use. Yeah, whether you know whether they're staying in the gym, whether they're going out, whether they're in trouble, you know, all these things. Um, so you factor those things in, um, and then. Then the, maybe aside from conditioning, you know, because I mean, that's something that's sort of insuperable. You know, if somebody's in shape, a, a mediocre fighter who's in great shape will often beat a really good fighter who hasn't taken things seriously. A mediocre fighter who's in great shape will beat a great fighter who doesn't take conditioning seriously. Often. Wow. Now, not all the time. I get it. Yeah, know, that's big. But I mean, you'll get, a, you know, probably the greatest fighter in the last 50 years or so was Roberto Duran, who late in his career stopped training mm -hmm. hard mm -hmm. and got beaten by people who wouldn't have been bums. his sparring partner. He shouldn't have lost to those guys. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't, I don't use the term bums for fighters, mm -hmm. but I, but. Mickey, they, Mickey from Rocky would have called him bums. Yeah, so, he would have. Yeah. Yeah. I have to, but yes. So there's that, but there's the other thing, and this is very, very important. In fights that have any consequence at all, as is true of almost anything with consequence, you have to follow the money. Who's supposed to win? Now, again, we're not talking about fixed fights, but we're talking about fights where, for example, if it's going to go to, to a decision, um, it's going to favor the guy who's going to bring money to the business. Now, I'll give you an example of this. A number, of, a number of years ago, Canelo Alvarez, who right now is probably the top money Cream maker. Cream of the crop right now. Yeah, he yeah, was fighting Floyd Mayweather, who was the top money maker in the business. Before the fight occurred, I told people, bet that the fight is going to be a split decision or a majority decision. I said, Mayweather will handle him with ease. He'll win nine rounds, ten rounds. He'll never, you know, he'll never be troubled by him at all. But... This young kid, who at the time was 23 or so, is the future of the business. He's got a demographic unlike anything anyone has seen in years. So he's going to lose. And they can't let Mayweather lose either because Mayweather right now, you know, is, is in the process of being the biggest moneymaker the, box, the boxing has seen. But they need to protect Alvarez. So what they will do is that they will have him either win one card or get a draw on one card, and then they can frame the narrative. So the narrative says, well, he's just a green kid, he's just learning, and he only lost, it turns out, a majority decision to the best fighter in the world, and then they'll reconfigure that, so it's not just the best fighter in the world, he suddenly becomes the best fighter of all time. You know, so his, in other words- How, how connected are the, the promoters to the media to the commentators, to the writers, to the ref, how connected are we? Like who's not on the same team and who holds who accountable? I don't know if you know what I'm saying. I know exactly yeah. what you're saying. In a sense, everybody's on the same team because- Why would they be though? Well, because if, for example, okay, here's a fight where it's important. I'll just go back to this example, where it's very important that Canelo um, saves face. So he needs to get a, you know, he can't win, he can't get a draw. Um, for a number of reasons, but he needs to lose in a way that opens the door for a next fight or something else that, you know, that this is a learning experience. 
Well, if judges, if referees don't follow the narrative, they don't get assignments. It's very simple. You want those jobs. If you're not doing what the yeah, and the promoter doesn't have to ask because so all it's of unspoken. These, it's a it's code. A compl- it's a code. Okay, so it's not like, you know, some of these media companies on the left and the right they get criticized for. You ever seen those videos where they show where 75 different channels, they're all they're all using the same rhetoric, the same line. Right. I don't know if you've seen that or not. And they'll show, you know, coronavirus is and, and the same exact big words they use. And it's like two sentences they'll all use. Right. And people will say they should have had a conference. Somebody at the top sent an email to everybody saying use these two sentences and they'll all use it. They look like robots, right? Right. In this situation, you're not saying there's not a call, there's not a meeting, there's not a memorandum, there's not any unspoken rule that I'm telling him, hey, can you whisper whisper to Charles that, hey, uh, he needs to lose, or she needs to lose, or he needs to, Is that's not taking place in a box. It world. doesn't have to take okay. place. It's unspoken, they it's know unspoken. it. unspoken, they all know it. Okay, so how, when did you go and flip from just being somebody that could read the fighters and pick them well? When did you flip and saying, Maybe I ought to think about, you know, fixing these fights and get involved in that. How did that transition take place? When I started spending my own money. Okay. Because no matter what happens to your fighter, you're spending your money. And obviously, it's to your advantage. Well, I was going to say it's to your advantage that your fighter win. And that's true most of the time. It's not true all of the time. But it's true most of the time. And, so, well, I'll, we can get to that, why, why it's not always true. Um, but you, I realized that first I was wasting time, you know, by even, you know, I was picking, I was picking correctly almost all the time because I know the business and I know fighting, but especially with heavyweights, things can happen. Guys bang their heads, they, you know, um, they get hit to the body with a shot that, you know, there are contingency things that, that you can't predict. And I thought, this is crazy. If this other guy's going to lose anyway, why should he have to battle my guy for seven or eight rounds and really get kicked around when I can say to him, you don't have to do this. You're going to lose anyway. I guarantee you're going to lose anyway, but you're going to get hurt. But we can go home early. Fourth round, third round, fifth round. Yeah, whatever you work out. And you can work out, you know, there can be incredible specificity at times. But but who introduced you to this? Like when when you know a lot of times you you see somebody learns a skill or something. They, the time they go and they learn, they come out. They worked under a boss. They learn. They duplicate. They go do it. How did you learn this? I learned it a couple of different ways. I learned it from being in the gyms. That was part of it, and talking to fighters. Uh, but Tommy Tibbs, the guy who got me into this to begin with, fought a really really great fighter named Willie Pep, one of the greatest fighters who ever lived. And he beat Willie Pep. And I couldn't for the life of me figure out how that was possible. Tommy beat Willie. Yes. And he shouldn't have. No, not in any, right. Not in, and I said, how did, you, how did you beat Willie? And he said, oh, I didn't beat Willie. <laughs> he said, Billy, Willie beat Willie. He said, we just took the odds. And I thought, wait a minute. It, right, you're, this is about making money. It's not about pride. It's not about honor. I mean, that, those things exist. I'm not going to. I'm not trying to demean them, but primarily we're talking about money. And if you can, if Willie Pep is taking a nothing fight like this, for example, mm-hmm. and let's say this is in the late, or maybe the early 1960s, mm-hmm. and he's making fifteen hundred dollars for this fight, it's mm-hmm. nothing. If he, if he loses a decision that's predetermined and he bets on the other guy or the bet is placed on the other guy at 10 to 1, he's making $10,000. And that's a much, much smarter, you know, he's an older guy at this point. He doesn't have a career to go. He's not going to be a world champion ever again. And a lot of ex-world champions, and I know a lot of ex-world champions who do this, you know, it, it's, it's much smarter. And anyway, that's how I started to learn about it. And then, believe it or not, there was an ethical consideration. And I'm not going to tr- try to make myself out to be an angel or, you know, an altruist. But I'm a human being, and I, I started to see what happens to these guys. And I thought, you know, 
if they don't have to, I mean, they're all going to get damaged. It's just going to happen. They're going to wind up neurologically damaged. You can say that about virtually everyone. And the ones that you can't say it about are, you know, are the lottery winners. It's like, you know. Mayweather's a lot, lottery winner. Probably. Okay. Probably. Because we don't know yet. Because you don't know yet. Right. Um, and I thought, if, if I don't have to be part of this, if there's a way, you know, I can exclude myself from this, I'm going to do it. Um, because I think morally, it's, it's the right thing to do. The right thing to do is to fix fights, so you saved them four rounds of getting beat up. So in your own mind, you felt comfortable doing what you were doing. I felt very, I, I wish I'd done more of it. I wish I'd learned about it yeah, earlier. You wish you would have done I'll, more I'll of it. I'll tell you why, because you're not talking about four rounds. You're talking about 40 fights at six, you know. 160 rounds. Yeah, yeah. And, and gym work. And, and, you know, a lot of these guys are sparring partners for champions. And Some would say that's pretty crazy to be thinking that a way. Lot, a lot of people yeah. will say it's wrong. Yeah. And I, but my, you're comfortable with that. That's your position. It's absolutely my position. Today as it was 30 years ago. I'm more adamant about it now than I was 30 years so ago. So you wish you would have done more. You just said that. I, you wish, I wish I had done it the entire time. Okay, so what was your business model? So meaning uh, the system. Is the system, here we got 30 fights coming up. Let me see this one. Okay, this one. This one okay, boom. These are the four fights I'm going to pick to fix. Then, after that, I'm going to contact the manager or I'm going to contact the trainer. Walk me through your system. I can't do that. because I'll tell you why I can't do it. Because with variation, everything's a little bit different. And it depends on what the circumstances are of the people I'm talking to, what their conditions are, what's at stake. Um, I'll, okay, I'll give you an example. And I'll, I'll use names this time. At one point, I had a fighter who was a talentless fighter, and I it was talentless, talentless fighter. horrible. Uh, he'd been a, an Olympic finalist, and you know, boxing is a, a an intensely racist business. You know, the world is an intensely racist place, and he was a white heavyweight. Okay, so white heavyweight, you know, is the Moby Dick of boxing. That's that's where the you know that's the biggest potential money in the world. A white heavyweight. A white heavyweight. Why? Why is that? Because we're a racist culture. You know, uh, that's why a guy like Jerry Cooney, who was never a heavyweight champ, who I, I like personally, got purse parity when he fought Larry Holmes, who was the heavyweight champion of the world and one of the, uh, you know, inarguably one of the greatest heavyweights who ever lived. But because people wanted Jerry Cooney to be the heavyweight champion so much, there was so much money on the line, he could demand an equal, you know, payday and, got, and get it. You know, a completely unproven commodity. Anyway, I'm listening to you. I've got this white heavyweight who I, I've, I'm moving through the ranks and I'm keeping him undefeated, and I get suckered. I get completely outplayed in Atlantic City uh, by Bob Arum's East Coast matchmaker, who's a guy named Ron Katz. Now, I've got my unbeaten guy, and I've got Floyd Patterson training him because it's a good publicity move. You know, because Floyd Patterson was a beloved heavyweight champion, and the idea is he wouldn't be associated with someone who couldn't fight or someone who was, you know, he, he would be involved only with people who were beyond moral reproach. So I'm buying a lot of goodwill for this talentless heavyweight, a guy named Martin Foster. And he's coming in with a, against a guy from Canada, also unbeaten. And I assume that top rank is looking out for me, but I get played, and my guy gets knocked out in the first round by a guy named Tom Gillespie, and that kills off, you know, a year of money, a year of business, a year of building him up, a year of making deals, you know, it's, it's all done. Okay, so, he's still got a good record, and a little bit later, Riddick Bowe, who was a Wonderful fighter, heavyweight champion of the sure. world. He's making a comeback. Yep. And I'm, I get along well with his, his manager, Rock Newman. We get along well. I send sparring partners to him. And at one point, they need to put him back on HBO, Bo back on HBO. And I've got this guy who at this point is 11 and 1. And I say to my guy, look, there's no way in the world you can beat Riddick Bo. It can't happen. And he says, well, uh, you know, I'd like to try. And I said, no, you, you will not like to try. You got a wife, you got two kids, 
on your best day, the best that's going to happen to you is you're going to be beaten to a pulp by Riddick Bowe. That's the best that's going to happen. You're telling them this? Yeah. That's what's going to happen to you. Or you can get knocked out in the first round. Now, this is my guy, but the business decision is for him to get knocked out in the first round. And he said, okay, I'll do that. Now, the fight didn't happen. So I, there's no great ending to this story um, because Bo wound up doing bigger things and you know, he didn't need the tune-up. But there are times when it's to your advantage for your fighter to lose. So in that moment, if you do, if he does lose in first round, what is a payday for someone like you? Well, what do you make? What does he make? There are two paydays, or at least two paydays. Okay, so that's HBO. So it's it's a uh, in those maybe sixty thousand dollars. Okay, not much. You know, this is nineties. This is this is nineties. Yeah. So you know, he gets forty, I get twenty. So it's not a big payday. You one third, two third split. Yeah. Wow, which is what's pretty hefty. Okay, that's what the law allows. Okay. and I know a lot of okay. people take fifty, but you're not supposed to do one that. third. Two, so one third goes to who would you be considered? You're who? I'm his manager. You're his manager. You get a third. He gets two thirds. Correct. Hollywood is a lot lower than us. So boxing traditionally oh, yeah. is a third. Two third. My, my agent doesn't get. The, believe me, he doesn't get thirty three and a third percent. But that's not where the money is. The okay. money. So the third, two third, forty twenty. He gets forty. You get twenty. Where's the real money? The real money is betting that my fighter gets knocked out in the first round. How much is that? It's, well, it's at that point, that would have been about eight to one. So you put 40K, you put 320. I put the whole thing down. 60, you put in it. I put 60 in it. So you'd make 480. Uh, what is it? Yeah, it's 480. So how do you do it to not be under your name? Anybody can place those bets in Vegas. So you would tell somebody else to go place a bet for you? I d well, it'd be a number of people. Because you couldn't be, be one able. person doing it because you get too much attention. Like way too much attention. What are you typically looking at the max? Is it 5K? Like, you know, 16 people do five apiece? Uh, so, so no, for something like that, you'd use fewer. You'd use, you could probably get away with six people. Six people like do that. around yeah. 13 apiece. And, you, you, and yeah. you're generous. Got it. You know, you treat You them. give them something. You, treat, you give them a lot. You How do you know those guys well. don't flip on you? <sighs> well, you gotta, it's got to be people you trust, but yeah. also, how are they going to flip on me? What are they going to do? Well, what if they tell the world that here's what you did? So they kind of have leverage on you as Why well. Why would they do that? What, what's to it? keep the entire money. Well, they could do that once, I suppose. And they won't get any more if they do and, that. Right. And, and of Makes course, sense. if that becomes something that people know about them. Now, at this time, are you backed up by a mob family that's protecting you or no? Oh, no. You're not protected by anybody. Unfortunately, I was never protected by a mob family unless I was, you know, uh, fixing fights for their fighters. So let me go back to a question. I asked you a question. I said, so what is a system? You look at the 30 fights, you take three. Okay, these guys, no, this is the three I'm going to pick. And then from you contact the manager. You said, I can't tell you. Why can't you tell me? Because it's contingent on, it's, it's not that I'm keeping a secret from you. It's because it's contingent on a variety of conditions. Or oh, not, I can't tell you. It's my secret. I just can't tell you. I can't it could tell you be because very, it's not okay. one thing. Right. Fair enough. Yeah, right. I, I just thought maybe, because to me, everything is systematic. There is a system to the madness. Like even if you look at Ocean's 11, Ocean's 12, mm -hmm. right? If you look at the movies, I'm sure you've seen both of them. You've probably seen Ocean's Eleven. I saw the first Ocean's. Okay, so if you see first Ocean's, you've yeah, seen well, the first yeah, Ocean's. Yeah, 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 I'm not a kid. So you have to you have to think about who you need. You need a tough guy. You need an entertainer. You're gonna need a distractor. You need a, somebody that knows how to deal with safes, with locks. You know, somebody that's got to be pretty. You know, someone that knows the contacts. You know, someone that's a driver. So there is a system to the madness. That part of it, yes. You're saying in your world there is no system to the madness. Well, I no, I if if you use those criteria, yeah. That all exists. That continues to exist. In, in your world. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Can, you, can you tell us what that system would be? Like, what would it look like? What are some things you need to fix a fight? All right. For one thing, it, there, there's, there are a number of ways to do it. So I'll give you a, sure. a bunch of them. The easiest way is that you've got one guy who's going to get knocked out. By far, that's the easiest. And that's what you're looking for. It, you know, because, again, it doesn't take into account extraneous factors. You're talking about two guys and they control, actually, I was gonna say two guys, but that's not even true. One guy controls the entire play. So that's the easiest way to do it. The second thing is that you've got the ref. If you've got the ref, he can give, he can do things that engineers the, the nature of the fight. 
if your guy is getting hurt and isn't supposed to be, he can call breaks, he can call fouls, he can stop the fight. There are a lot of things that he can do. The other thing is that on any fight, if it's going to go the distance, you only need two judges. Hmm. And judges make how much money? A couple hundred grand a year? Judges don't make anything close to that. Okay, so you can buy judges. No. Well, here's the funny thing. Not, not only can you buy judges. Judges, this isn't true of all judges, but a lot of judges are in it because they like being in it. Lifestyle. Yes, connection. Yes. Who were you with tonight? I, I was I just refereed. Me, I was on I TV. Was, Mike Ty I was Got in it. a ring with Mike Tyson. What's an average judge make? Are they making money or no? No, they make, they, you can't make a living at it. Okay. Or you can't make much of a living at it. You know, it, it depends. I mean, there are, there are guys who, who referee a major fight. I just typed in right now, average boxing judge's salary. It's at 100000 to $250,000 a year annually. And that's a legit. That's, that's a star referee. That's a star referee. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So a regular judge, referee and making judge. a judge. Yeah, yeah, regular yeah. guys not making Nothing. that kind of. No, they okay. all have. They all so have these guys want to be in the life. They're like, oh my gosh, look who it is. Hey, you know, the you know starting player for Chicago Bulls comes and shakes my hand. You that's, know, Hollywood star is here. So it's kind of one it. of those and things. That's, and that's what Got you it. play up. Got it. So you become friendly with these guys. So you got, number one, is a guy's going to get knocked out no matter what. Whether it's the ninth round, the fourth round, the second round, you're getting knocked out. Why don't we convince you to knock out in a first round? Number two is a referee. Number three is a judge. All you need is two of the judges. What else do we have? Um, other than that, that's, that's really all you need. Got it. So who you know? talks to who? Like, how do you talk to the judge or how do you talk to the referee? What does the conversation sound like? when you're speaking to these guys? Well, again, it depends on how well you know them, how close you are to them, and whether you've done business with them before. There are guys you can say, you've got to give my guy the decision. Straight up, you can do that. You can also say to people, look, I'm, I'm trying to build so-and-so. If you can look out for him a little bit, I'll appreciate it. And, you know, it's four favors down the line. And again, you have to be good, you have to be as good as your word. It's very important that if you say you're gonna do something for somebody, they have to know that you're really gonna do it. Got it. So, my mind, creative mind went somewhere. Okay. In a business model like this, I see fear. Hey, Joe, if you don't do this, dot, dot, dot. Okay, fear, threat. Number two is selfish, okay, which has to do with money. Mm -hmm. And number three to me is favor. Right? Favor. Okay, so you got favor. Hey, look out for this guy. It's bringing up. Let's take, look out for him. He could, you know, okay, great. I'm going to look. Don't worry about it. I got, I got you, Charles. I'm going to do this. Right. Great. Right. The other one is money. The other one is fear. Which of those three tactics is the mo most effective? Money. Okay. You know, now, I didn't deal in fear. Because uh, you didn't have backup. That's why I was wondering yeah, if you had right. anybody. I'm not, a, I'm not a tough guy. Yeah. You know? Now, there were times when I when I was working, when I was fighting, making fights for mob guys, that the fear was inherent and it was implied. You know, but they, you never brought it up, they just knew. I would say he's with him. He's Got it, with, he's with, you know, he's yeah. with whatever. Yeah, I mean, if I was bringing a, you know, a Russian fighter down south, well, the inference someone would make is, why is a Russian fighter fighting mm. in you know, the Carolinas? Well, look at who's going to the ring with. I got it. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and you always, you know, and you're not stupid. And people love to be told that they're not stupid. And they love being in on stuff. Got it. So, Johnny, you're not stupid. That guy's right there, just so you know, his muscle is right there. I don't even say that. What do you I say? I say, look at him. Look at him. Look who he's with. And it, see, Got it. it doesn't matter who Got he's it. with. Now, let me it, ask you, how, how dangerous is the life for a referee or a judge? Yeah, you're like, you know, you know how in, in soccer, remember that one, uh, Colombian uh, soccer player accidentally kicks the ball into his own goal. You know what happened to the guy? They killed, I, 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 they I, killed the they guy, killed right? Him. I don't know if you know this, sir. They killed the guy. You know, uh, 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 the, these stories happen. I, is it a dangerous life to be a referee or a judge, or are they pretty protected? I, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I would say it's not particularly dangerous. Okay, so they're protected. So it's not like they're not worried. Not even protected. It's that mistakes happen. You know, and it's not, that's nothing that people get Got killed it. for. The other thing is that, again, you have to understand the way the business moves. A couple of mistakes in key places and those, you know, those contracts dry up. Charles, at your peak, what kind of money were you making? 
Oh, not a lot. Not a lot. Idea. Mm. I'm trying to think how much of this I can say. Best fight you well, ever, like what's your best fight? Best one you had where you said, I made shitload of money on this one fight. Uh, just just under a hundred thousand. Just under a hundred thousand. That's your purse. That's mine. Well, okay. not purse. That's what I made. Right. You, what you made off of that. Yeah. Okay. And you know. But uh, I lost a lot more than that. Than the biggest loss I ever did. What's your biggest loss? I lost a hundred, uh, four hundred and four hundred and twenty or four hundred thirty thousand dollars. How did that happen? It's an amazing story. I'm not sure if I got suckered or if I made a legitimate mistake because the person who brought me that bet was my best friend in boxing and a guy who actually saved my life. So I hate to think that I got taken, but the deal was this. There was a middleweight championship, vacant middleweight title, between a guy named Reggie Johnson and um, a guy named Stevie Collins, Irish Stevie Collins, who were very, very well-matched guys. And if, if the fight were real, which it turned out to be, uh, it would go, neither one had ever been knocked out Neither one, neither one ever did get knocked out in their career. So it would be a close fight and it would go to a decision. Okay. My friend Al Braverman, who was Don King's director of boxing and really my closest friend in boxing, um, said, I've got something that just came over the transom. You might be interested in it. What would you do if I told you that you could get three to one on Stevie Collins over Reggie Johnson, and I said, "What? What? What do I know? You know, what? What don't I know about this fight?" He said, "That's the right question, but as far as I know, nothing." Your friend is telling you this. He's telling me this. He the says, guy who saved your life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, saved him from, from the mob. Interestingly enough, he saved your life from the mob. He did. So the mob was after you, and he protected mob was after, you. Yeah, yeah, not for this fight, but for something, something completely else. different. Yeah. yeah, I'm curious to know what it is, but please oh, continue. I'll be happy yeah. to tell you yeah. that. Although that one, we won't give names, but because they're all still around. Um, but it should have been an even money bet. And I thought, well, you know, he said, but the only thing is it's got to be a big bet. Okay. So I got together all the money I had w without having to borrow, which at that point, I, it was either 430 or 420, and I don't remember which. And I had to fly in a private plane under the radar down to Santo Domingo to get the bet made. And Fight went the distance. It was very, very close. And, and, and the, the other reason I bet Stevie Collins is politically, it was by far the more, the, the, you know, the, the better business uh, move because Collins had big business with super middleweights in Europe. There were a plethora of big money fights for him to, to, be, to be made for him. So I thought, of course he's going to win. You know, as, as Braverman said, nobody gives a shit about either of these fighters. I said, well, in Europe, they... You know, Collins, they do, but nobody gives a shit about Reggie mm -hmm. Johnson. So he loses. Anyway, Reggie Johnson wins a majority decision. And I'm down in Santo Domingo with my bodyguard and cash and whoever I bet against, who I never met, some gangster, had his two bodyguards and they had their cash. So I handed over the cash and that was it. And I thought, well, you know, I made the wrong bet. It happens. You were supposed to make what, 1.29? It was 1.25, I think, or something okay. like that. You're a good mathematician. Yeah. yeah, I mean, enough so that I was gonna get out. Yeah. And I was gonna- You were gonna get out, like I'm uh, done with it. I'm done, I've got, yeah. I've got money that nobody knows about. I'm gonna live in the Caribbean. Quietly. Yeah, yeah, I, right, I don't need this. I mean, you know, I'm, uh, I already owned real estate down there, but I was gonna buy- How many times have you, have you replayed that moment in your life? Well, here's the thing. At first, quite a bit, but I, you know, it's done. There's nothing you can do about it. But here's what I started replaying. I thought, if the guy who I lost the bet to could find 10 people to make this bet with and buy the, the judges, one, you know, it, again, two judges, 10 people, you know, that's, that's 4 million, 300,000 or 4 million, 200, you know, for nothing, for no, I mean, you have to have the cash to put up, but that's not so hard to do. And he walks away and I thought, did my best friend- Get a cut on it. Got a cut on it. Are you still friends with the guy? He died, He's, he, was, he was an elderly guy when I knew him. 
He, he died in a completely innocuous way. How did he way. save your life? How did he save your life? Um, I was making fights for a kid who was in the, uh, whose father was in the mob. And they had spent money on this white heavyweight. I won't say his name. He was terrible. He was absolutely horrible. And um, I had been doing business down south with a veteran matchmaker. And who, who knew his business, guy who really understood what he was doing. So this kid was going to turn pro, this mob kid. And we brought him to a safe environment where under the radar, you know, nobody, because we, we wanted a first round knockout. And I was given money to give to this matchmaker, which I did. And I said, okay, so it's one round. It's one round. And he said, um, yeah, no problem at all. We're at the fights, and I don't, I, Patrick, to this day, I don't know how this happened, but just before the fight, I had this intuition where I went into the loser's dressing room. And the loser was clearly a kid who couldn't fight. I mean, I could see that right away. And I was talking to his, his handler, his manager, I don't know who the guy was. And I said, so he knows what to do. And he said, what do you mean? He says, you mean, does he know how to fight? I said, no, I can tell you, he, he doesn't know how to fight. But you know what's gonna happen, right? And he goes, I said, how much did you get paid for this fight? And he goes, you know, we get paid 80 bucks a round, four round fight. And I said, okay. So I go back into the, the audience because the New York guys are all there. And I said, look, there's a little, there's a little issue here. I'll, and I still remember the, the kid's father gets up he puts his arm around me and he makes sure that I see he's got a gun. And he says, well, you're going to handle it. And I said, yeah, I'm going to handle it. <laughs> and he says, okay, uh, how bad language can I use here? Whatever you want. Good. Yeah, it's fine. He said, if we don't get what we want, we're going to kill you. We're going to kill that motherfucker who stole our money. And we're going to kill the fighter and everybody else we can think of. And these are serious guys. He whispers this to you. Yeah. And he's a boss at the time. He's not a boss, but he's, you know. Connected. He's connected. Yeah, yeah, he's connected. And he's, and he's the, you know, he's got the fighter. So. He, and he's and, the son of a son of somebody, somebody powerful in the mob. And, and they've already, they're already spending a lot of money on this kid's career. And this kid cannot fight at all. Not, not even a little bit. And he's petrified because this is his first pro fight. So I go back to the dressing room and I say to the kid, you're going to lose this fight. You're going to get knocked out in the first round. And he says, I can't do it. He's a Southern kid. He says, I can't do it. He says, my, my parents are in the audience, my sisters and brothers. And I said, we're going to all be dead in the next 10 minutes. And it gets weirder. He says, he's from New York. He's going to kill me anyway. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. He's in his dressing room throwing up right now. If you even look at him, he's going to faint. I know you can't fight, but he doesn't know that. So, you're going to lose. And then the matchmaker comes in. And I said to the matchmaker, what did you do? He goes, this kid can't fight at all. I said, that's not what you got paid to do. You got paid to fix the fight. Fix the fight. He goes, no, but it's going to be a one round fight. He can't fight. I said, you took his money. and. I said, give me all the money you've got, everything you've got. He goes, well, I, some of this is my money. I said, it's not your money anymore. It's this kid's money. And then I said, and I said to the kid, I, I'm not gonna tell you his name either, but I had a, a brainstorm. I said, look, you don't have to fight under your own name. Nobody cares. Make up, and I'm just gonna say like his name is, uh, you know, Billy Alexander, which it's not. I said, make up a name. He goes, and he's crying at this point. He's actually crying. He goes, um, Bobby Alexander. And I said, no, no, Billy. See, Bobby Alexander sounds quite a bit like Billy Alexander, you know? And he'd say, well, Bobby Malexander, you know, it's okay, we'll take care of it. <laughs> and I said to the matchmaker, you got to give this kid under his own name four wins. So he starts his pro career at 4 0. This does, this is, you know. So he said, okay, we'll do that. And I take the kid out into the parking lot 
And there are still people straggling in because this is, you know, an early, this is one of the first, this is in fact the opener of the fight. And I said, put your hands up. Now, I'm not a fighter. And, you know, I was a lot younger then, but I wasn't a fighter then either. And I hit the kid in the mouth as hard as I can. And then I hit him in the stomach as hard as I can. And then I hit him in the mouth as hard as I can. And he starts, he gets a bloody lip. And I say to the kid, the guy who's kind of, the towel comes in right then. That's what happens. And I said, don't you throw a punch back. Don't you dare throw a punch back. This is how it is. And I said, you throw the towel in high, right up to the middle of the ring, and you yell something as you throw it in. Which he did. The fight lasted 17 seconds. And it looked sensational. And the mob guys, they love me again. Everything is good. And I think, okay, everybody got what they wanted. That's good business. And then they say, we need to talk to this matchmaker. And I said, you don't need to talk to this matchmaker. He, you got exactly what you wanted. He's scared to death. He didn't make a dime. He lost his own money. It's done. Just think business. Just think You're telling this to the mob, yeah. mobsters. Yeah. yeah, this is business. You know, if something had happened, it would be, you know, I could see the, the, the wisdom of doing something about it, but there's nothing to be done. They said, go get him. So we drive over to the restaurant where this guy, the, you know, is eating with the matchmaker. The matchmaker is a rich kid whose wife bankrolls these things and they're, you know, they're, they're spending time with their society friends, you know, rubbing elbows with, with the fighters. And this matchmaker is sitting and eating with them. And I said, come on over here. And he gestures, I'm eating right now. And I almost never get mad at anybody. And I thought, okay. <laughs> I go to the matchmaker and I, I'm to the promoter and I said, we need to borrow this guy for a little while. And this is one of those guys, you've met them, we all met them, a promoter, who has a sense of when to cut, to cut loose the weak, you know, the weak part of the herd. He knows that something's going on. He goes, go ahead and take him. So we bring him out and the mob guys said, get into the van. And I think, oh, Jesus Christ. And so he gets into the van and I get into the van. I'm thinking, this is so stupid. But, you know, I'm also thinking, this is it. And they make this guy direct them, because he's a local, out of town. So they're driving. We're, we're in the van in the back seat and we're surrounded by these mobsters. And one of them, I, one of them I know what he does for a living, and I won't say what it is, but you can guess what it is. And they're talking about the matchmaker as if he's not there, which is maybe the scariest thing of all, because he's pleading. You know, he said, I know I made a mistake, I'll never do it again, it was, it was stupid, I, you know, I, the, the guy I got can't fight, it's nothing, you know? And they're talking about him in the third person. You know, what do you do with a piece of shit like this? You can't reason with him. I think, no, oh, no. This guy's over with. Well, that's what, so we drive out to the middle of the country. They open the van. They say to the guy, step out and walk 10 feet to take 10 steps. And he's stumbling. And I think, all right, well, you know, and he takes 10, 10, 10 steps. And they say, okay, get back in the van. And they, nothing happens. They drop him off. And I said, okay, that was great. You know, you scared them to death. You scared me to death. And they said, oh, this isn't over with. And it turns out it wasn't over with. So something happened. He died. Later. They I'm killed gonna, him. I'm not going to say what happened, but I because I can't say that. But well, he's not around anymore, physically, not, spiritually, around. but not physically. I don't even know if he's around spiritually. And then somebody else associated with the same. Did thing. that happen fairly quickly or no? Not as quickly as you would imagine, okay. but but fairly quickly. Yeah. And then somebody else had a mishap too that I can't talk about. The other person who had a mishap, but not the fighter. Not the fighter. The fighter, okay. fighter as far as I know, is still around. And but. the guy that, that brought his fighter, the guy that, uh, the, the son of a gangster, is the, is, the, is the gangster no longer around, but the son is still around today? I think they're both still around. Oh, you're saying they're both still they, around? They, yeah, I think so. I mean, they're not. Have they're I not. interviewed them? No. 
Okay. No. Well, that 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 takes a lot of names out. It takes it, it takes yeah. yeah, yeah no, you haven't, and and you would. And you know who I've interviewed. I know some of the people okay. you've interviewed. Right, yeah. No. 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 It wouldn't have been, no. I one of them in particular would come to mind, but no. Okay. No. Got but it. but what's interesting is that they decided they were going to kill me. Uh, partially because they thought I would give them up, which is something I wouldn't do. And Al Braverman fixed it for me. The guy who the 420, 430, that could have been a 1.25. Yeah, I was living in the mountains of Puerto Rico and they were looking for me. And I was getting really desperate. I mean, I was really getting desperate because the guy who was gonna be dispatched liked me and he called me before and he said, you better straighten this out. And I said, are they sending you? And he said, I think they're sending me. So you better handle it. If they send him, it's over. It's over. Yeah. It's over. I mean, it'd be hard to find me. But, you know, I don't necessarily want to. I, in those days, I lived in a place called Las Marias, Puerto Rico. It's in the mountains. You know, it's the middle of nowhere, and I liked it there. But it's not where I wanted to spend the rest of my life. Anyway, Braverman had us all meet in New York. And I came in from, from Las Marias to New York, and we had a in-person meeting. And he said, uh, we can sign your kid with Don King. We can sign your kid with Don King. He said, we can sign your kid with Don King. But Charles is with us. And he's not talking to anybody. And this is the end of it. If, if anything happens to him, your kid will not be welcome anywhere. And if he does get a fight, you're going to wish he didn't. And Al Braven one of those guys who's just completely fearless. You know, just a... And so that was it. And of course, I've never mentioned their names. Let, let, let me ask you, how much till today is that still happening? How much is fixing still happening today in boxing? It's about the same as ever. It's about the same as ever? Yeah. Yeah. Fight fixing. So, so, so let me ask you. So, you know, how every time there's a fight and you, you're sitting there, you're like, there's no way in the world what just happened here. That, there's no way that guy should have won. Are you kidding me? In every possible way, the other guy won. Right. I don't know how this makes any sense. Right. And then people will go on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and say, this fight was fixed. I'll never watch another boxing right. fight. Right. The next big fight comes. They're that ordering it on pay per view. Right. Why is that? Why is, it, why is it that even though fans watch fights knowing it was fixed, they still keep wanting to watch these fights? Because, well, for one thing, most of the fights you're talking about go to a decision, right? It's a bad decision. That's a decision, yeah. So they see a real fight. I'll give you an example. Now, I, I don't know personally that this is fixed, but I would bet my life that it was fixed. Do you remember a number of years ago, um, Manny Pacquiao sure. fought a guy named Tim Bradley? Yes. Okay. He beat Tim Bradley nearly to death, mm -hmm. and he lost the decision. Mm -hmm. Now, at this point, Pacquiao is maybe the biggest moneymaker in boxing. Or, um, you know, maybe Floyd would, maybe, you know, but he's certainly the most influential guy in boxing. I mean, he's going to be the president of the Philippines. I mean, you know, he's a major sure. icon. Yep. He wins nine rounds, ten rounds, and he loses to Bradley. Now, a couple of times I'm watching this fight and I see that, that Manny can knock him out. And he doesn't do it. Get out of here. Again, Manny has, this is what people tell me, tax problems. And he's got, got gambling problems, and he has hangers on. And the odds, again, are about eight to one. Mm. I think what happened is he said, it's not going to hurt me in terms of my marketability because everyone's going to see I won this fight. So that won't do me any harm. And whatever you can make, make. Now, I don't know. I, you know. Eight to one, you put two million, you make 16 million. Whatever you can make, yeah. yeah, whatever you can put down. And in China, you can put down a, you know, a ton of money in the, you know, at that point. What do you mean China, China you can put down a ton well, of money? Well, at, at one point, China wanted, was, you know, uh, Manny was Aram's fighter at the time, and Aram was looking to do big business in China and wound up doing some promoting there. And my guess, again, it's just in you know, kind of experience speculation. That's all it is is that's where the money came from. And I think everybody made a ton of money. And to me, that's a fixed fight. To you, that's a fixed fight. Sure. I mean, that to me is also a fixed fight. So, so somebody behind closed doors bought two of the judges. Yeah. That's what you're thinking. It did it in a way that didn't harm. Do you have any insider clue, insider feedback that gives you even more validation that this happened or no? Uh, on this fight, I'm not even sure if I remember what happened, but I, I'll, I'll tell you there's a the kind of rule of thumb that you can follow. If a fight's gonna be fixed, 
were within, through the judges, you often see the, the kind of standard names who show up all the time, and then a ringer comes in from out of town who no one's ever heard of. Don King used to do this all the time. He said, who, who is this person? Got and it. that's a bot judge. Uh, that happened in uh, one of uh, Lennox Lewis's fights against Evander Holyfield, where I forget the woman's name, but you know, this completely improbable score, and she showed up for the one fight, and no one had heard of her before, and no one has heard of her since. And you know, so let me let me ask you this other question. So let's just say if I'm Vegas, I'm the other side, right? Well, if you're Vegas, what you're trying? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, what, what I'm saying is, but if I'm Vegas on the other side, the eight to one is to me as well as much as it is eight to one on the street money, right? Okay, because right. I'm dictating the, the the numbers. So if I'm Vegas, yeah. Am I not hiring the highly intellectual investigators like you? And I'm getting somebody like you. you you're like an IT guy. You're not a fighter. Right. You're brains. You're you're a guy that's sitting. You can read all that. I would give a guy like you a quarter million dollars, saying, "Hey, can you read the bullshit and to see if anything's going on?" And I got twenty of you guys on a payroll. But nothing. But nothing's going on in a fight like that. The odds are exactly what they should be. Think about it. The yeah, odds. But yeah, but but okay. So for example, give me an idea in the insurance industry. Yeah. Okay. I've been in the insurance industry now 20 years, right? right. I've dealt with AIG, Transamerica, you name them, I've dealt with them, right. right? Okay. So one of my client dies, okay? Got it. I got a quarter million dollar insurance policy on him. Getting ready to deliver the quarter million dollar insurance policy, okay? The investigators come and they do their audit if it's within two years. In contestability clause phase that they have, they'll go through it, right? Mm -hmm. And they'll go back and they say, wait a minute, this guy tested the uh, non-smoker, but the last 17 physicals that we looked at and any kind of thing he's tested for, Everybody said he's a smoker. Why did he come out in a non-smoker? They'll go deeper and they'll say, oh, his brother peed for him instead of him peeing for him. We're not giving a quarter million dollars because they spent, they have the brains, guys, they hire to go do the investigation. That's what happens on an insurance case, right? Sure. All the time. Why isn't Vegas hiring a full-on team of 40, you know, uh, forensics guys that can go out there and audit to see how dirty it was and on the inside, let's... Figure this, because if you don't, yeah, this person can never have a job here ever again. You will never work with us ever again. You think this is fun. You think you get, you will never be a referee here ever again. You will never be a judge here ever again, because I can control that, right? Why wouldn't Vegas hire a team of forensics to catch Good this? Good question. For one thing, judging is, is, is subjective. Now, it's true, everyone's going to look at it and say something's wrong this. But the other thing is you're talking about one fight where they get, they get hit, they get hurt. But you're doing business with them all the time. You know, there's, you know, every once in a while you're going to take one on the chin. And you do that. That's you your know, I mean, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you another example. Okay. I, I was in the room. I brought Vin Vecchioni, I paid for him. I flew to, to New York with him to talk to Al Braverman when he fought Mike Tyson, okay? So at that point, this is the biggest money event in sports history, it's not anymore, but it was at the time. So we go there, Tyson was supposed to fight somebody else, he was supposed to fight, uh, he was supposed to win the title on his first fight back. He was supposed to fight Oliver McCall, but Oliver McCall is a, was considered too much of a loose cannon, and he would have knocked Mike out. I, you know, Mike, we can talk about this in your show, by the way. Uh, you know, so they, they come up with this kid, Peter McNeely, who's got a totally fabricated record. Um, so Meaning what? You know, he's fighting guys who can't fight. He's got a, you know. He has a record, but it's not like it's anybody real. It's 38 one, and, okay. and, and uh, you know, and he's fighting guys who just can't fight even a little bit. And, and in friendly environments, too. So, um, but, the, so the fight gets made. It's the biggest money fight in history, the biggest sporting event in history at the time. The day before the fight, I get a call from somebody I know. I'm still, I'm in Puerto Rico again. And he said, somebody just made a million dollar bet that the fight wouldn't go a full 90 seconds. Somebody thought you might be interested in that. Now, I couldn't do anything about it. I was too far away, I couldn't get a bet down. At the 89 second mark, my friend Vin Vecchioni steps into the ring, forcing a stop to the fight. Now, 
somebody made that 90 second bet and I know who did. And you know, it takes nerves of steel to, to wait till, you know, you, cause you have to find some plausible reason to do it somehow. And you know, you have to hope. Now this is not a fixed fight in the sense that neither fighter was told to do anything. It's based on what Finn knew about his fighter's skill level, that he was terribly overmatched. The point is, Vegas understands that something went wrong. You yeah, know, because the questions they asked post-fight were like, he was selling himself why he got knocked out at 89 seconds. If you notice closely, my knees buckled. Yeah, yeah. The, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. But here's the thing. And this is... Well, you were saying he didn't know because Vegas thought he knew. That the, the fighter knew? The fighter did not know. Peter had did, no clue. No clue. He, no, he was told. Because again, if he had gone... if a miracle had occurred and he'd won, that would have been even bigger. Because again, you got a white heavyweight who's knocked out Mike Tyson in his first fight back. So you do it again. So there's no lose there. It doesn't matter. You know, I mean, obviously, the thought it matters is to the one better than $1 million, whatever the amount is with the 90, 90 yeah, seconds, 89 well, seconds. Right. Yeah. So, but here's the thing. Okay, so... How feared of a person was that $1 million better? Oh, uh, my guess is not feared at all. Okay, I, th I, think, I think what happened is Vin found a, one person or a couple of people and cut him in for a big piece. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Got I it. mean, it, it wasn't a, it wasn't a uh, sports book bet. Got it. It was a private bet. Okay. Anyway. Please. So you have to assume that people who are associated with boxing in Vegas look at this and they see something's not right. You don't step into the ring to stop a kid. Even He's going to get knocked out, maybe. But this is the biggest event in history, and what can accrue from it is enormous. So you give him a chance. If he gets knocked out, he gets knocked out. But, you know, nobody knows what Tyson is at this point either. You know, he's been in jail for years. He's put on tons of weight, and he took it off, you know, in ways that have nothing to do with getting in shape. Um, you know, so he looks great, but he's not in fighting shape. At first, they think about holding up the purse. But what happens if you hold up the purse? The biggest money fighter, a guy who brought in about a billion dollars in revenue for the city for that, for that fight, if he's under, you know, under suspicion, it means the whole game is under suspicion. Now, do you fuck up the whole game mm. for this one thing that got yeah. you the result you wanted anyway? Yeah. You don't. So, you know... So that's that's how something like that. Are there, are there any fighters where you you went up to them? You're like not, you, were, you you said you fixed how many fights? Hundreds of fights. Hundreds of fights. Hundreds of fights. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and were any one of them you fixed like title fights? Were there any big big fights or no? I fixed I fixed um, champion, uh, championship fighters fights many times. I didn't fix championship big fights. big names people would know about. Yeah. Big names people would know about. Yeah. Oh from, yeah. From 80s 90s. From the uh, 90s to 2000s, early 2000s. When was, heavyweight, lightweight. For, yeah. All over. But, but um, I'm trying to think of how many former heavyweight champions. Do you have a fight you fixed, hypothetically? Do you have a fight you fixed that you were part of that if the world knew about it, they would be shell-shocked? Yes. Yeah. A, a, a few of them. I, I can't, they're, they're, they're around. And you know, when people can, do can we, favors, can we Can we do like one question? Just one question. You don't have to answer. I can but try. I'm, 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 I'm going to ask the question. I'll do me. my best. Because let our imagination have some fun. I will do my okay. best. See if we can answer this. The one that we would be shell-shocked was the fight or Latino, black, or white. The one that you would be shell-shocked, both fighters were black. I mean, if you would have said uh, Filipino, uh, we figured it out, but that's yeah, definitely not going to be the case. I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you one more hint, <laughs> okay. and, but this is where it stops. Riddle, give us a riddle. Both, both, both fighters are black, and both fighters at one time had been the heavyweight champion of the world. And you haven't mentioned their names today? No. Okay. No, they're both around, they're both friends of mine. I, we've given a lot of clues. So I, if, if I'm a betting man, a person should be able to figure this out. And these two were in the 90s. These were in the 90s. Okay, at this point of the game, I mean... People who are watching it, they're probably guessing down, they're putting their names there. But again, you're not going to say who it is. So this, 
And this was a this was a you thing. This was a mop thing. This was a collaboration. This was a the fix. Were other big names involved in the fix or? Oh no! This is this is something so, that, that the fighters themselves fixed, and uh, they knew about. It. Yeah, the, my guy called me beforehand, he and neither me. one of them talks about it till today. No one knows about it. It's never been written about. Never been never, talked about. Never, never, never. How many people know that that fight was fixed? If you were to say, there's this many people that were on the inside. Two of them are no longer with us. How many are living that were involved in that fix that would know it? Five names. Three maybe, names? Maybe five. Maybe, maybe five, five names. Maybe five. And you Inclu guys have, inclu including the fighters. Including <laughs> the fighters. You guys have kept it to yourselves all these years. Uh, uh, let, you know what? Let wow. me change it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no. Listen, uh, five names. If you guys are good at keeping secrets like that now, the CIA to. should hire you. You should <laughs> hire me. The CIA should come work. <laughs> we want you on our team. I want you, Charles, yes, on the well, CIA. Dang, that's pretty intense. And you're saying it still happens today. Now, let me ask you a different question. So, uh, my opinion, my opinion where I'm at. Okay, so you got boxing, okay? Uh, before I get to my one question, one basic question I'll ask, is there anything, any sport or any game that's more fixed than boxing, in your opinion? Or you may not know. I don't follow sports. So okay, so you really, don't know horse racing? I'm told by people in horse racing that horse racing is almost entirely fixed. Entirely fixed? Almost entirely fixed. Okay, so perfect. Let's put so all those know. paintings that horses have on the wall, I should take them down. Do you want All that money I spent on these options, take these things down, take man. Them down, take them it's down. fake, it's probably another horse. Let's put the horse's name down. That was 99 to 1. He probably should have won the whole thing. But uh, okay, boxing, UFC. UFC comes in, okay? Yeah. It's controlled by a personality. Boxing doesn't have that. UFC is controlled by a, a boss. Right. Dana White is a boss. Right. He's not a, uh, a, a uh, you know, Adam Silver personality. He's a, David Stern could have been a boss. David Stern was a boss. I don't know if you all are David Stern I, basketball. I don't follow yeah. sports, but I know who But I'm answer. talking commissioners, right? Yeah. Different sports, yeah. okay? Yeah. You don't hear a lot of this stuff with UFC. Matter of fact, there'll be a UFC fight where the judges favor somebody else. They know why it goes and fires them. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he just flat out goes and says, you're flipping fired. Make the hell out of here. You ever do something like this again? So to him, it seems like he is so maniacal about making sure fixing doesn't happen in his sports. Do you think fixing also happens in the UFC world? Well, again, I don't, I don't follow, don't so I don't know. Yeah, but don't my guess is he, you know, Dana White seems to have the thing so monopolized and is making so much money at it. Yeah. And part of the, it seems to me, part of the pitch for that is that we don't play games. No, anybody can lose at any time. You know, even, even the guys who are building up, they can lose. There's no great shame in losing. If that's true, there are probably good reasons for him not to fix fights. But I, but I don't know. That's yeah. an uninformed opinion. Like, you know, like for example, give me an idea. If, if I'm a fixer, Okay, yeah. if I'm a fixer, let's just say uh, uh, my name is Dana White and I'm trying to set up for a big fight. Conor McGregor is fighting Poirier, right? Mm -hmm. Conor's supposed to win. Right. Conor loses. Right. Poirier knocks him out. It's like, dude, people don't want to watch Poirier fight, uh, you know, uh, Khabib. They want to see Conor Khabib, right? Yeah. Everybody in the world was pissed off because that's the big fight. So if it is about fixing, you go and tell Poirier drop, you know, in second round because, right. but it didn't happen. Right. So that's the part where the game keeps the integrity. The fight keeps the integrity. Um, was there any any time where some big boxes, and you know, we can wrap up on, on a couple of these, and I'll give you the final thoughts. Anything else you want to share with us? Um, was there ever a fighter where you're like, you know, we tried to get this guy to fix, was a big name, he just wouldn't do it. He has so much pride, he wouldn't even do it. Whether it was at the end of his career or not, he just wouldn't do it. Was there any anybody like that? <sighs> Again, I if there were, I, I, I wouldn't tell you. But no, I'm, I'm just curious, if you know, like I'm not asking for a name. There's was a, there any fighter where you're like, this guy was a cover on every ring magazine, everywhere, sports list, we knew him, but he wouldn't, would, no matter how much you paid him, he wouldn't do there it. There is one guy um, who was in fights that were fixed that he didn't know were fixed, who we were interested in getting. I was interested in getting, other people were interested in getting, and it was no dice. Uh, I can say again, he a, 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 was a very, very high-profile heavyweight champion. Mickey Ward? Mickey Ward. <laughs> no, Mickey Ward, as, as far as I know, Mickey Ward's only been in real fights, as, as far as I know. No, I see Mickey, like, you know, his fight with Gotti. Yeah. 
seen it. Three, three of them. One of the greatest fights of all time. I mean, you can't just sit there and watch that one. God, he's down. Oh, my yes, God. It's like, oh, my gosh. Guys, just. There's another round. There's another round. Like, what the? Like, I the know. fans I won know. that day. I mean, the oh. video today's got like 100 million views. You can watch it on repeat over and over and over again. Yeah. See, it's fights like that. You know how they say in golf, you know, here's how golf works. You hit one good ball, you're coming back. You yeah. could hit one good ball, you're going to come back and try this again, right? And like, today sucked. And like, oh, did you see that drive? Let's do it again next week, right? Right. Boxing's that you get that one fight. We haven't had it for a while. I mean, I haven't seen a good boxing fight for a while. But you, you, you look at the Mickey fight, the Gotti Mickey fight. Mickey Ward made a million dollars in the, se- I think it was in the second fight and certainly in the third fight. Now, here's a guy who works in construction. His top payday is about 40,000 bucks up until then. HBO says, we'll give you a million dollars. And of course, it was the smartest million dollars you could find, right? I mean, you know you're going to get something for your money. And they did a movie about him. It's actually a very good story. I don't know if you watch it. I, well, I, I know yeah. Mickey. I knew it was who's, who's, who's the biggest fighter? Who's the best fighter you've ever seen? Yourself. You're a fight, uh, fan. Well, I, favorite when, fight of when, all time that you didn't fix and screw up. Like, favorite I, fight of all time. When I was a time. boy, I actually saw Sugar Ray Robinson fight live. So, Sugar Ray Robinson. Any specific one or just he was your favorite fighter to watch, period? He was my favorite fighter. He's the best fighter I've ever seen. Now, when I saw him, he was 41 years old. He was, you know, way past his prime. And he, in a fight, fight where the judges got bought, interestingly enough, in Boston by Sam Silverman, he lost his title to a guy named Paul Pender, who's a Boston fighter. The best fighter I've Now, so I saw, I actually saw Robinson live. And he's the best fighter Sick. ever. But the Robinson I saw was a 41-year-old Robinson. So the best fighter I ever saw in his prime, by far, was Roberto Duran, who I saw fight live when he was 20. At 20? Just Hands of stone. Monster. Uh, you know, he fought in Madison Square Garden. I, I went to the fight. He fought a guy named Benny Huertas, who was a, not a good fighter, but a tough guy. And he knocked him out in the first round. Everybody in Madison Square Garden said, okay, we've, we're seeing something important. We're seeing somebody memorable. And it turns out he was, you know, better than, better than anyone I've ever seen. I mean, Tyson swears by him. Tyson, Tyson's like a big Durant fan. You right. know, it's a, I went to Panama. And when I went to Panama, he had a restaurant there. He would always dance with his wife at the, at the restaurant. Uh-huh. And you just see a regular guy. What well, people don't just realize, a regular just guy. 25 years prior to that, he would whoop your ass. Do it right now. He, he, he probably would do it right now. With he would do it right now. Yeah, <laughs> he, he would do it right now. Doesn't look like a boxer, though. You see, it doesn't look like a boxer, but it's um, any, any, give you the last chance here. Your book, Low Life. <laughs> Low Life. Do any, I have to do I have to train any, a secret any, for selling any, the book? Any last untold stories you have for us to share? Any crazy last untold stories you have for us? Just think about it like you got a bunch of your grandkids, let's just say they're watching right now. They're sitting there saying, Grandpa, Papa, Daddy. You don't you don't give think me that, one you last think, story. You don't give think me. that the, the Tyson McNeely thing is okay, I'll give I you think, uh, give me one more. Okay, I'm greedy. I'll, 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 I'll give you I'll give yeah, you one. One fight, more. Fight, fight, fight that didn't happen, but I, but it's worth okay, telling us. Okay. Tyson is in prison, okay, so, and Tyson can't fight. I know, everyone knows Tyson can't fight. He was, he, now, I'll, I'll give you a little backstory too. He's put in prison deliberately because he's dissipating. Remember, he's the biggest money fighter in the world, but he's falling apart. What year is this? This is when I, just after he lost to, uh, to Douglas. So this is like starts in the late 80s. So he gets convicted on a rape charge. King does everything he can. To keep him out. Just the opposite. Just the opposite. He needs to put him on ice. He's falling apart. So he's going to implode. What's the best thing you can do? Take him out of circulation, and he becomes the hottest property in the world. Right? All, and it doesn't matter who he fights when he gets out. But he can't fight anymore. That's important to know. So I've got a guy named Mitch Blood Green who fought Tyson once on the street and once in the ring. I say to Al Braverman, and they hate each other. I say to Al Braverman, how about Mitch Green? He goes, you know, he's crazy. I said, I got something for you. Can you get him into the the, uh, facility where Tyson is being kept? 
He said, yeah, I can get him in. I said, just get him in, just get him in. He said, why, what are you gonna do? I, people are gonna wanna know what Mitch Green has to say to Mike Tyson, since they're mortal enemies. He goes, oh, I can get him in. He said, what's he gonna say to him, Mike Tyson? I said, he's not gonna say anything to Mike Tyson. What's he gonna do? He's gonna nail Mike Tyson. He's gonna hit him with the best shot he can think of. And when Tyson gets out, who's the fight that everyone's gonna wanna see? And you've got a safe opponent, <laughs> And I've got, I've, I've just made a million dollars. So, why didn't it happen? Because Mitch Green says to me, how much are you making? I said, I don't know. You're making a million dollars. He gonna get more than me? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know. I said, yeah, so knock him out. And then you'll make more than he does, and he says, I ain't doing nothing to promote that guy. And I couldn't get him to do it. Why didn't he want to promote that guy? He hates him. He Just hates because him. of that? Just because All of that. All the money in the world he wouldn't do A million it. dollars, we're both broke. A million dollars. And I said, Tyson can't fight anymore. Just get through the first few rounds and he's, I, mean, I can see it. You know, he's gonna implode and then you'll be the heavyweight champ. And, and my guy, she has no business being the heavyweight champ, but you know, Things are what they are. And Tyson, I can see, doesn't want to fight. So that's it's kind of a boxing story. That's a, that's a boxing story for sure. That's a crazy boxing story. Folks, if you're watching this, uh, Low Life, a memoir of jazz, fight fixing, and the mob by our friend here, Charles. Thank you so much for coming on. Great I really pleasure. enjoyed it. Thank Patrick, you. Thanks so Definitely. Much. Really enjoyed it. We're going to put the link below to order the book.